Dear friends, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this third round table of Rural Digital, where we'll present two inspiring international experiences shedding light on the promise of digitalization for the rural world. But before we do, I'd like to remind you that to the left of your screen, you'll find the buttons that would lead you to the workshops and stands of our initiative. We hope that you take full advantage of the content we prepared for you. Every day, the relevance of digital technologies in our daily lives and in our productive work is becoming more and more important. This is true for the city, but also for the countryside, where interesting experiences are being carried out throughout the world on how to best articulate communities and rural producers to digital technologies. To talk about this topic, we're joined by two excellent panelists. Ms. Annie Lin, Alibaba's Rural Vitalization Commissioner in, Pingsburg, uh, in, in Pingshong County, Shang, Shangxi Province, forgive me for the mispronunciation, and Benjamin Groib, digital agriculture expert at the FIBL Swiss International Cooperation. Welcome very much to, to this event. Aniline was the Senior Director of Alibaba's Fligi Division uh, prior to joining Alibaba, she served as the founder of Lishin Network and assistant president of MangoCity.com. She developed the first multi-location call centers in China Southern Airlines. She has accrued a rich experience in the internet, tourism, and aviation industry. In June of last year, she was assigned to Alibaba's Rural Vitalization Commissioner for Pingshong County, Shangxi Province. She's committed to using digital technology and e-commerce to support rural development, digital capacity building, and sustainable development. Ben Groip works as a digital training expert, bringing digital training materials to an organic farmer to an organic farming to farmers around the world. He focuses on the delivery of digital training materials on organic farming to farmers. And he's an entrepreneur and has brought his knowledge on sustainable agriculture, digital solutions, and innovation to startups, corporations, the United Nations, NGOs, and government agencies all over during the past decade. With Farm Better, he co-leads a team of change agents in the journey to bring digital advice to farmers in Kenya, across Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Aniline, let's start with you. And Ben, both of you, welcome to this conversation. And Aline, I understand that you've prepared a video for us from Alibaba Rural Vitalization Commissioner working on local governments on these digital solutions. So let's watch it together, shall we? Hi, everyone. My name is Dong Hongling. I come from the Corporate Social Responsibility Department of Alibaba Group at Alibaba. There is a special task force with a unique role. We are called Alibaba Rural Vitalization Commission. Our task is to work closely with the local government officials and farmers in China's less development regions to promote their economic growth with three focuses, industry, talent, and technology. In May of 2021, I arrived at Pingshun a formerly impoverished county that is still an underdeveloped region in North China. Although I perform my daily duty in Pingshun, a village thousands of miles away from Alibaba's headquarters, I always feel empowered since my role are fully supported by Alibaba's digital ecosystem. It's my great honor to share my first-hand observation of how digital technology is empowering the less developed regions to pursue new development opportunities. In the wave of digitalization, new formats of jobs are emerging. More and more flexible online careers such as live stream hosts, cloud customer service agents, AI trainers are created. Maybe you ask, what do these new jobs to do with the rural areas? Well, I'll show you some new bone careers, how to make the lab behind women to realize values and drive the outflow use to return home. The woman who is doing the live streaming in the field is one of the beneficiaries. She has been a migrant worker for a mine kitchen before. 
When her daughter returned home to start an online store, she had no idea at all about the live streaming. Last year, I led her and her daughter to the 2021 Wear the Internet Conference. It was the first time that she took a flight. She did an eight hours live streaming a day in the conference and felt no tired at all. I asked her why. She said, I'm so exciting. I've never seen so many viewers. I waste no time but to communicate with my fans. Since I arrived in Pingsun, we have conducted live streaming training for more than 5,000 farmers. Most of them have mastered live streaming skills and could connect with the outside world through mobile phones. According to a research by Renmin University of China on employment opportunities brought by Taobao Life, in 2020, Taobao Life created more than 1.7 million jobs across China. Among them, women were mostly benefited through these new opportunities. Live streaming is the new job on the screen. I would like to share an interesting job that is behind the screen. We creatively brought a new job related to AI to Ping Sun in July 2021. AI, artificial intelligence, may sound very intelligent. In fact, behind the screen, AI requires a lot of basic labeling work, which is critical for machine learning. Since AI is driven by massive amount of data, AI models require a large amount of high-quality data to support, which has led to a huge market demand for data annotation. Based on the local investigation, I work with my colleagues to classify the skill levels of labeling business and identify that AI could be a good new job for the local community. During the past 17 months, we have conducted intense training for the employees here. Till now, 150 employees have been recruited, of which 70% are college degree or above. 40% are out for use returning home. At the beginning, they could label about 500 pictures a day. After months of practice and training, their productivity increased by four times with an amazing accuracy rate of 99.9%. .9%. That means they have become skilled professional AI annotators. Take this girl as an example. She used to work outside of Pingxuan. She has never thought that she could find an ideal job at her hometown that is better than urban city. Now, after a year and a half's hard work, she has become the supervisor of this labeling center. The AI labeling job in Pingxun proves that digital technology has brought new opportunities not only to the urban cities, but also to the rural areas. Based on this pilot, Alibaba's AI labeling project will be implemented in other underdeveloped counties in Guizhou, Shanxi, etc to help more rural residents to assess new opportunities. Well, let's talk about the barriers we encountered when we were carrying out the above projects. First is the basic infrastructure. There is still a gap between urban city and rural area when talking about internet and logistic infrastructure. The Chinese government is trying their best to accelerate the internet access to every village and realize full coverage. Secondly, training facility and education are critical for success. This training center is built by the Pingxun government. Farmers could join the offline or online live streaming course which are offered free by Alibaba and they could use this live streaming studio without any charge. The big challenge is that it it takes a long way to educate the farmers to be used to face directly to the consumers. The amazing thing is that if the farmer learns how to do live streaming, the different scenic and dialects turns to be the rural live stream advantage. Last but not the least, 
Digital transformation knowledge popularity among government officials to be considered. I've trained over 500 government officials after I arrived in Pingxun. In addition to the digital career opportunities, we are making efforts to explore Pingxun's culture and tourism development with digital technology. This is the Dayun Temple, one of the 15 national relics in Pingxun. You could see that it is surrounded by mountains. Few visitors notice it. How to arouse the interest of the potential tourists turns to be a new topic. At the end of last year, we work with Friyi and Auto Navy to create a smart destination for Pingxun. Data shows that the ticket bookings of Pingxun's national relics have been forced forward of last year. Last month, we cooperated with Tim Moore to issue 12,000 digital arcs for four national treasures of Pingxun among Tim Moore VIP members. It aroused great interest and Team Mo donated the incomes to Pingxun to protect the relics. We hope that we could find a sustainable and referable culture protection model through digital technology and the future. As Daniel Zhang, Chairman and CEO of Alibaba Group said, Alibaba is committed to the nationwide strategy in poverty reduction and rural revitalization. In particular, we hope to explore as a pathfinder a scalable, innovative approach to promote rural development as an internet company. Hope that you could take away something from my sharing. Welcome to Pingxun. Thanks for listening. Annelien, thank you so very much for putting together what an amazing video, what a great experience, so comprehensive, so ambitious. And I think equally importantly, I'm blown away by your level of enthusiasm and the passion that you show for this experience and how you really have the, the boots on the ground as you share these experiences. Thank you so much. And let me ask you a question. Um, what role would you say the national government has played in promoting digitalization? Uh, in, in the rural uh, experiences that you have shared, what is the role of the national government? Yeah, if we uh, talking about the the national government's roles in the digital transformation, I think that the first one is the infrastructure and logistic improving, including access to internet and uh, e-commerce platform and access to the road, access to the logistic network, and access to finance and the mobile payment sy system. For example, in China, right now we are accelerate the construction of digital infrastructure, such as mobile internet, internet of things, cloud platforms, and gradually realized um, broadband access to every village. China's existing administrative village have fully realized broadband access. Yeah, according to data from the Ministry of Commerce, as of December 2021, the number of internet users in China has reached 1.032 billion, and the internet penetration rate has reached 73%, of which the number of the rural internet users has reached 284 million. And the internet penetration rate in rural areas is 57.6%. The rural online dealer, dealer and online shop have been over 16 million, means one sixth million. The national rural online retail sales reached 2.05 trillion yuan, an increase of 11.3% over 2020. And the growth rate accelerates by 2.4 percentage points, accounting for 15.6% of the national online retail sales. Yeah, and secondly, I think that we, the government need to enable the business environment and policies, give some policy support. That means they have to provide some traditional factors as well as factors specific 
to economics, to e-commerce, like direct subsidies, logistic training, and online products service and incubation service as well. And most important that the infrastructure and internet access and the government also need to give some uh, special regulations to make it easier to do the e-commerce. And thirdly, I think it should be the digital literacy education. Education is most important. That means that the e-commerce skills needed to use the internet for operation, provide customer service, how to provide the online customer service, and develop online products. It's quite different from the traditional agricultural products. It, it, means that you need to select the standardized products, uh, for example. And so, uh, and another thing is like the capacity for training and educate entrepreneurial spirit, I think is also quite important. Yeah, things, if you want to start a kind of e-business or e-commerce, you need to take some risk and you need to be resilient in pursuit of such kind of opportunities and the digital transformation. So I think that may, maybe these three key roles should be played by the government. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. And Aline, thank you so very much. Very, uh, very clearly you've, you've outlined a very compelling model for, for rural development and in, in, in a very strong partnership between private and public sector. Thank you so very much. It is for me particularly impressive to hear your numbers. The numbers that you list are the size of entire nations in other places of the world. So it's just really fascinating to benefit from these experiences. And thank you so very much for, for allowing us not only to hear you, uh, but also to see you know, the images of what's going on at the landscape level with, with, with the people on ground. So um, yes. we're very yes. blessed and we're very, very lucky that you have prepared not only one video, but, but two videos for us. So, so next, uh, I, I understand that you have a, another video uh, that, that showcases how digitalization is being promoted in connection to the land and to improve the quality of rural people. So let's, let's watch it together. Thank you. Thanks. Ellie. Yeah. Chang 成长的未来也都为科学的统计者快完布了科技轻巧地连接起广袤的土地和远方的人们曾经山林的特产
，用产业绿价值增值。乡村正在因产业开启着多一种繁荣。是希望的热土，越来越多年轻人愿意扎根这里，建设家乡。教他们学会更多，因为家乡需要多样的发展。把城市里的工作搬进乡村，因为这是时代的乡村。忙碌在田间地头的人们，如今。可以是生产线的技师，也可以是家门口的白领，甚至是自家农产品的代言人。大家好，欢迎大家来我的直播间，像我们家乡产品、绿色产品、玉米。干得好农活的双手，同样干得好另一番事业。朝气蓬勃的年轻人，让家乡蓬勃发展。今我在。这是时代正在为我们展开的画卷。低头看看脚下，我们就站在这里，手握着希望的种子，扎扎实实的投入，实实在在的帮助。这片土地不可辜负。阿里巴巴投身乡村振兴。在更好的土地上，长出我们更好的未来。Might seem like the future. It seems in many respects the, for 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 you in China, the future is now. So it, it's just fascinating to 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 benefit from these experiences that you're learning. Thank you very much. And now, my friends, let's switch to our second excellent panelist. Thank you, Anlin, uh, uh, Ben. Uh, so Ben, I understand that uh, you've also prepared a a video uh, showcasing the work, the great work uh, you're doing with your team at Farm Better. So very much looking forward to to watching it together and 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 reflecting about your experience also. Let's go. <laughs> Let's have a look. <laughs> Okay, hi. My name is Sylvia Kuria, and I'm a small-scale organic farmer from a place called Ndeya, which is in the semi-arid area of Limuru.、Um, it's about 40 kilometers from Nairobi, and we have been farming on this、uh, piece of land for the past seven years. And、um, we're actually practicing agroecology and organic,、uh, sustainable farming practices. I'm going to group them into three main challenges. So one, of course, is、um, the negative effects of climate change. So we find that we don't have enough rain, and the rainfalls,、uh, the rainfall is actually very unpredictable. Right now, we are going through our fourth failed,、um, actually going to the fifth failed rainy season. So four times you have planted, and four times it has failed. If it doesn't rain in these short rains of November of 2022. Then we don't、um, expect、uh, much, and it's going to be the fifth failed rain. So you find that、um, the effects of climate change are here with us, and now we are paying back for what we've done to Mother Nature in a way that we don't actually have enough food. And then something else is that、um, farmers don't have access to information. So you find farmers lack information on how to actually grow food sustainably, and it's worse for farmers, especially in the arid and semi-arid areas. You know, for me, I'm a bit lucky because I have access to the internet. I can be able to read and look for information. But the local farmer here has no idea where they can get information. So farmers don't have access to any information, and they're not able to know what strategies to use in、uh, the dryland areas. They don't know what kind of seeds to source for, how to plant, when to plant, what kind of farming practices will actually give them a good return in an arid area. 
So because of that, you find that the lack of information is a very huge, huge impediment to farmer success. And thirdly, we also have a very huge gap uh, between um, um, uh, science and practice. So you find some research has been done, but we never get access to it. So researchers are working on their own and they don't really disseminate that information to farmers. And farmers, on the other hand, even if they get a hold of the information, they can't understand it. Sometimes it's too technical and they're not able to relate to that information to see how it can actually um, support them. Okay, I've interacted with the Farm Better app and um, from what I've gone through with it, I find that you know it's an excellent tool that can be able to be the gap or be the bridge between science and practice and also be the bridge um, also maybe between policy and practice whereby farmers are actually able to um, access information in terms of videos, how to be able to farm, you know, like how to be able to um, get strategies for your farm and be able to grow your food uh, sustainably. So I find that the Farm Better app is actually um, an easy tool that farmers can be able to access at the touch of a button on their phones and be able to get all this information in one package. My name is Michael Zeni Malenya and I'm the Director of Business Development and Scaling at Farm Better. There are three problems we want to solve as Farm Better. Number one, uh, farmers' day-to-day -day practices are impacted by the negative effects of climate change, yet they lack access to tailored knowledge in, a, in order to adapt to the changing uh, climate. Number two, many smallholder farmers across the world um, lack the digital literacy to use mobile apps. And number three, extension agents have limited budgets to travel uh, to farmers and no effective tools to manage these farmers as well. Now, as Farm Better, we are a an agri-tech company that connects farmers with knowledge on how to improve their climate resilience and improve their livelihoods. Uh, we have an app that is designed for farmers or through extension agents for farmers to match their unique profiles with peer-reviewed sustainable land management practices from the Walker database. We're back, friends, and, and Benjamin, thank you so very much for putting the, this video together for us. It's just like dawns, dawns on me, like the severity of the challenges that our uh, sisters and brothers in Africa are dealing with and, and the limited resources we have often to address in, in what seem to be even like simple things like access to knowledge that can empower folks to take control of, of, of their own production systems. Uh, apparently so simple, but so powerful to leverage technology to that and very inspiring to see how you are tackling the significant challenges to agricultural sustainability uh, in Africa. So Ben, I understand that in addition to the video, you prepared a presentation for us, explain a little bit better and, and, and offer a little bit more context about your work at Farm Better. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Sarush, and, and yes, I, I think it's, it's, it's really uh, great to be able to talk a bit more uh, as a startup on, on what we're working on in, in especially East Africa, uh, India, Nepal, um, and partly also starting in, in Colombia soon with Farm Better, where it's really about bringing digital advice to farmers. That's really where we started out with. Um, and then, you know, you can see, I think, a bit the, the differences of context also from the approaches that we're taking to what you saw from Annie Lin in, in China, which is just an incredible place when you look at, e you know, rural e-commerce. That's, for me, really down the road, but it's just so inspiring to, to see that. Um, so. Um, having said that, what, what we're really looking at are, are these three challenges. Michael talked about them in the video. You know, we have the negative um, uh, impacts of climate change. Um, and then, you know, the thing is, people have, a lot of people have access to knowledge, 
but it's often, especially if you want to, you know, use, um, you know, sustainable agricultural practices, you have to have it, you know, locally specific, you know, soils are different on one side of a hill than on the other. So based on that, you know, you really need to have that tailored knowledge of how to approach uh, agriculture. And, and that's what's missing in a lot of places in the world, especially for smallholder farmers. Um, it's often not such a problem for, for a larger, a more resource endowed farmers. You have lots of technology, you know, Annie Lynn also mentioned in the internet of things, sensors and so on. But where that's not the case, that's where uh, we're trying to come in. Then we have the digital literacy challenge we also heard about. We, we really started out working directly with an app just for farmers because we want to be as farmer centric as possible in empowering farmers to increase their, their climate resilience because that's where we come from. Most of us co-founders uh, have been working in development, have been working on climate resilience and went from projects to say, let's start a social enterprise and let's try to set this up in a more sustainable way. Um, so that it can go beyond project cycles. And then we've we've met lots of extension agents, you know, public and private, which love to talk to farmers, give some of that knowledge they have on, um, but that actually often don't have just the resources to actually get to the farmers, um, or they just have hundreds or thousands of farmers to deal with and no effective tool to manage them. Um, I don't know how you feel about, you know, all the parties that are being organized in your WhatsApp groups. You just start losing over, over the, get, you just start, you know, losing the overview at some point. So imagine working with 300, 500, 1,000 farmers as an extension agent. That's where Farm Better comes in, uh, where we're really trying to, based on, you know, farmer's location and their priorities, um, match them with sustainable land management practices. We have over 1,000 on the app um, that are also, you know, uh, scientifically reviewed. They're from the VOCAT database um, on sustainable land management practices. What else is on the app? You have on the left what a farmer sees and you have on the right what an extension agent will see. If you're a farmer, you are have actually that digital literacy that we're trying to build across the world. You can do this yourself. You know, you answer a few questions, you share your location. We go back into a number of public, some FAO databases and look at, you know, what agricultural zone you're at, what's, what kind of um, slope your land has and so on. And based on, that meta, based on that data, we then match you with sustainable land management solutions um, or best practices. You might have um, just uh, an issue with your tomatoes, so you can just go search into it. Um, there's a community forum where farmers exchange on things like, you know, how to deal with certain pests, how to get certain inputs. We have a library in an academy where we have 10 um, interactive courses now on topics from regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, pruning trees so that you can get uh, a higher price for your wood products. And we're working on a marketplace with currently simple information on where you actually get your inputs, but we're really trying to work with partners to enlarge that and offer farmers um, you know, offer farmers access to climate smart inputs, loans, access to markets, which is a huge thing. Uh, for extension agents, it's much more about organizing the group of farmers they work with. They also have access to all the knowledge and the resources. They also have active cases, which might be, you know, a pest infestation. It might be a challenge that the farmer has told you about that, you know, you're, you're working on and you can then, you know, communicate with a group of farmer in a certain area um, or beyond. What do we collect and, and how does that work in terms of actually having tailored knowledge? So, you know, we have a short few questions on farmers' uh, climate resilience, their goals and their location data that creates a unique farmer profile. Um, and based on that, uh, we then match them with sustainable land management practices. I'm happy to talk about more about that if somebody's interested, but I, I won't go into the details now. We're a relatively small still startup. We're working now in six countries, mostly and most strongly in Kenya, where we are at about two and a half thousand users um, who we're working with and really um, looking to scale through this AgriPath project across um, East, uh, some West Africa, Burkina Faso, and also India and Nepal. We're not doing this alone. I've mentioned WOCAT. We're working with a number of great organizations, uh, really close to farmers um, and trying to really bridge that science uh, research, you know, pr practice gap that Sylvia in the video mentioned. We've gotten um, some funding and some prices and it's just really great to see that traction from, uh, you know, a year ago on this slide, there would have been much fewer people and really seeing how with Sylvia and Michael and Naum, we're strengthening our team in Kenya. We've just gotten a new board of advisors um, that brings not only the knowledge on business, um, but also, you know, on sustainable agriculture and on startup, on the startup ecosystem uh, in, in East Africa. Um, 
so much about us that was very quick deliberately i really want to also have the chance to hear a bit from 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 the audience the listeners and tell you just a little bit what we've what we've learned over the last few years that we've been doing this one um we've always wanted to have an app for farmers because we think that's the future we still think that will be the future but we're also seeing that right now digital literacy internet rates internet access rates i mean uh, you know outside of china but also especially in east africa let's say outside of kenya uh, access to mobile money to actually pay for things are rel relatively limited. So what we're doing now, we have an app for uh, extension agents that integrates directly with WhatsApp so that farmers can actually use a tool they're already used to, that they're most likely already using, that doesn't you know, use their data on many countries uh, and interact, um, uh, interact with the app and the knowledge through a simple chatbot and then extension agents. Um, it, we've had a lot of talk about, you know, how do we um, how do we bridge that digital divide, the gender divide um, for for digital advice in agriculture? This research project that we're in, AgriPath, actually looks at that. We're, we're researching that across uh, the African and uh, part of Asia, um, across the African continent, part of Asia, really to try to identify what are the barriers and enablers for women to have uh, access to digital advisory services. It's a lot, as, as usually in agriculture, around access to productive resources, um, but 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 it's 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 more uh, difficult than that, and unfortunately we don't have any results yet. That's ongoing right now. But as soon as we have them, I'll be happy to share. And then we've been really focused on having a human-centered design approach in in designing our app and what we're offering being with the farmers, testing with them and involving um, lots, um, at least half of, of the people we work with, women within that. And then the last one, um, for us is really around partnerships. Um, we see that farmers, it's just a very tricky and complicated business. They're really smart. They have a lot of wisdom already. I think we need to build on that. That's really what, what we want to do. And you know what we're offering right now, which is really close on focused on knowledge is one part. Farmers then the next thing they want is always market access. I think Annie Lin and Alibaba there is, is creating you know interesting linkages. Um, but just generally, you know, getting to markets, knowing what prices are, simple things like that. Pest and disease management, especially when we're looking at regenerative sustainable agriculture is a key issue because it's much more complex. Um, and then how do we get the right inputs? How do we get loans and insurance? We don't think, and that's a bit also our learning over the last few years, we don't want to, and we don't think we can do that all on our own, but that means we need partnerships, um, both with public and private institutions, with other companies in that field, and working with also you know, the government extension workers, partnering up with them um, on getting knowledge to people, but also on how to get you know, uh, farmers linked to the market, improve their livelihoods and climate resilience. I'll stop here, really uh, interested uh, in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, it, it, you're tackling a, a, a very, very difficult problem of really fighting against this one size fits all and leveraging digital technologies to do this careful matchmaking between the specific context specific needs of a farmer in a particular location and the content and the knowledge that is available that would maximize this product market fit. So it's very interesting how you're tackling this problem and trying to rescue and bring to bear this information available to make sure you do this, this matchmaking appropriately. I'm very intrigued by a question. You represent a very different segment uh, of the private sector. And mm. in a recent study uh, of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, they've concluded that smallholder farmers in Latin America are not benefiting from ag tech. By and large, uh, startup entrepreneurs are not really reaching this particular segment of the population we're interested in. I'm very curious to hear from you. In your experience as a startup entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur, what would you say is the role of the public sector in supporting these young innovators that really want to bring their talent to bear in solving this very critical social problems. What is the experience of this budding, young social entrepreneur who wants to bring innovation <laughs> to bear in the countryside? And what are what is the potential role we can play from the public sector? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's quite a question, right? Um, I think uh, Annie Lin actually has 
put out if a lot of a lot of key factors already out there um just generally to make sure that business can happen right uh, basically i would say even simple things like logistics and infrastructure without that it's just impossible and and also when we stay on that level you know the ease of doing business how hard is it to open a bank account in different countries how hard is it to get you know all the different reg registrations across different countries so that's just basic ease of doing business beyond beyond the fact that we're in a really fragmented, difficult market um, with, with a lots of smallholders, each one just kind of a small customer. Um, beyond that, I think there's, there's some areas that are really key in agriculture specifically. That's around, you know, how much are we still believing in the public extension system? How much are we investing in it? Um, I think there is there is a role, and there is also a role in a digital future. So we're not here to say, oh, you know, we're we're just getting rid of of um, of, uh, of of extension agents. I think they're a key front line um, to to make sure that 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 we can reach uh, smallholder farmers. So that's 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 it. You know, investing generally in, in research and development and innovation. No not just not just new products, not just new seeds, but also social innovations. How can we use existing networks, communities, and what's already there to really to really reach people? And and then beyond that, uh, another thing that Annie Lynn said, you know, digital literacy. How can we really how can we really make sure that 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 people in rural areas who've gone through schooling they know how to use a smartphone? That that needs to be in curriculums. I, I, I really think so. Um, not just in Latin America, but across the world. Um, and and lastly, um, I think it's it's um, there's a big point around how much do we as uh, do you as governments do the economies really want you know disruption um, and wants young new different companies i think it's it's easy to say okay you want to support startups but um it's it's a it's a big step to really create conditions that do that um uh, you know have accelerators have um have support programs mentors and and really think you know basically think from the farmer at the end of the day and think, you know, if I were a farmer, what digital services would I like? What is it that the government, what we can actually bring in on the digital side? And where do we, that's what my, was my last point around partnerships. Where do we want to partner? Where do we want to bring others in who have, who have experience? And, and sorry, just one last point, Serge, then, then I'll stop. But it's, it's really what you said about this study. It's, it's across the regions. It's really, really hard to make a business case work with smallholders around knowledge. Uh, that's why we're expanding it also beyond knowledge um, but but it's not impossible and it's imperative um, if we're trying to really create vibrant rural economies um, that there is there is kind of perspectives there and and the reason it's so hard it's because you know there's just such a fragmented fact, uh, market with so many different actors with different needs uh, across different countries Fascinating, Ben. Thank you so very much for sharing that experience, your knowledge, the journey, and also those insights that you can gain also from, from having your boots on the ground and experiencing and really endeavoring to bring that value to smallholders, which is sort of a, at least a, a population that often gets forgotten in terms of it delivering business models or wrapping business models around solutions. So thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for these fascinating experiences that show very contrasting realities, approaches, context so it, it really enriches the conversation and the sources of inspiration that we will draw from in order to to continue bringing uh, value towards this initiative so at this moment i'd like to open it up for a broader dialogue and, and question and answer uh, session and i would like to uh, remember our audience that to please feel free uh, to send your questions through our platform or our youtube channel whatever channel you're engaging with us uh, to so let me start, I'd like to start with Annie Lin, uh, with, with one question uh, for you, uh, Annie Lin. Um, China has made significant uh, achievements in the development of e-commerce in, in rural areas. What, are, what would you say are some achievements that you would highlight that might have relevance for Latin America? <laughs> And Eileen, you're, you're on mute, if you might unmute your microphone. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I have a, just a little knowledge about Latin American and Caribbean countries. But as a senior internet users, 
I have purchased Brazilian nuts and chili red wine, Argentina, yeah, Argentina, like beef and seafood through Taobao. Yeah, you know that I'm, in fact, I'm a senior internet user. And I think that in fact, Latin American and Caribbean countries have high quality agriculture products. No wonder that you are called the rarest breakfast provider. Yeah. And I think that the achievement of Latin America and Caribbean countries e-commerce development in rural areas, maybe by the time being, being I think they have gained global popularity and have good access to the global market through different channels. And they have tried their best to use the global digital service platform to enable the agricultural products to reach the consumer directly. Yeah, and in, in, the, in addition, I think that the unique tourist resource in Latin America turned this destination to be one of the popular tourist destination in the world. Yeah, in fact, two years ago, I went to Antarctic on behalf of Frigi to join the Antarctic cruise. And I think it's it was a real thrilling and fantastic trip, I have to say. And after that, a series of short videos to promote Argentina gourmets and unique sceneries have been issued by Yuku and Frigi a year and maybe a year and a half before. And it has aroused great interest of Chinese audience. So I think that the Latin American country is quite skillful, uh, or I have to say professional in the digital marketing. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's as a user, I think, think so. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. An interesting insight. Uh, indeed, it, we have a fascinating opportunity, a large basket, the portfolio of, of food items. Uh, and, and it's just so fascinating to hear that they've been reaching you as a, as a consumer. And, and thank you for sharing that experience. And um, how fortunate to have had the, the, the trip to the Antarctic. Uh, that, that, that sounds like a fascinating experience. Thank uh, you for sharing I'm that. I'm quite fortunate, yeah. <laughs> Let so me shift to, to, to Ben with a question. Um, Ben, what role would you say national governments played in promoting digitalization in, in the rural world in, in your experience? What, what, what is the role of national governments in, in creating that enabling environment and enabling conditions for digitalization? Yeah, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I learned in some of my law classes um, is, is usually the correct answer, which means it depends. Um, it's, it's just such, such a wide question, right? Like I can see that, for example, in, in the Kenyan case, I can see that, you know, the fact that Safaricom and M-Pesa have really been able and been let also to, to go into mobile money. So that hasn't been limited to banks, but as actually to mobile network providers, uh, that has made a huge difference, for example, for digitalization in rural areas and, and how money reaches and what all the services that can be provided. Um, at the same time, I, I think it's, it's, it's just a really, really broad question. Generally, it's, it, they play a really important role um, I think the way, you know, uh, licenses are given to telecoms to make sure, you know, th to try to make sure there that, you know, internet actually reaches rural area and high speed internet. Annie Lin also mentioned it in the broadband internet in, in China. I think that's a, that's a key area on the infrastructure side. Um, and, and when we go more into agriculture, I think I would also point out the, the, the example of India, which has just really, really pushed digitalization generally and has, has used that also in agriculture. Um, they, they have a huge, you know, uh, system on, on, uh, on, on, on subsidized foods, they have digitalized all of that. A lot of the service offerings actually from the governments have been digitalized. And that, I think taking this kind of role will, will bring along the private sector because it creates an, an incredible market. It creates competence to be able to actually deliver these services. And I'd encourage governments to really see, you know, where we are, where are we providing services in the rural areas? Where, where 
can they? And then here's here's the caveat: not everything has to be digital, right? But I, I'm seeing a lot of areas where things were actually much more comfortable during uh, during the the time that COVID was more uh, present because we could do everything online. And I'm seeing a lot of areas where we are going back to having to go in person to offices and I'm having a hard time understanding that. And, and I think that opportunity we really need to take and say, hey, we actually have the capacity right now. We've just proven we can do it. Um, let's push that forward, not just in the cities, um, but also in the rural areas. That's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And, I, and what I'm what I'm thinking is this really like it, it's a broad question. The, the, the particular needs of the country and opportunities are going to be uh, specific, um, but really closing this digital divide, at least this, this this basic foundation that would enable the other solutions to be presented and tested. It's going to be one thing that uh, of, of key concern. Thank you for sharing also about about those experiences. Uh, and the advances that India has also made in that front, perhaps th this would be another opportunity in, in, in the future to bring uh, experiences from, from, from that part of the world as well. And then I'd like to ask you the, the same question. I'm curious about what your perspective might be uh, on that too. What role would you say uh, your national government has played in promoting digitalization uh, in your experiences? What, is, what, what do you see the role of the national government in, in promoting this, uh, these digital solutions and digital agriculture? Well, digital solution, I think that the most important of all is edu education. Yeah. Especially in this time of digital transformation. And uh, yeah, I think that education is the most important thing. So normally in the rural areas, we will set up service organizations. Yeah, that means we will establish e-commerce associations by the local government. And, and cultivate local e-commerce service team mm -hmm. and continuously incubate and foster new e-commerce business through good products and brands and build where the miles referral and attract more people to participate. In fact, it's quite difficult to start to arouse the interest of the farmers to start the e-commerce business. Yeah, so I think the education is, is the most I think it is the key issue, key issue. And secondly, I think that a kind of professional team is quite important. Yeah, that means talents. So first the government needs to promote and publicize the training purpose and contents to encourage farmers to understand and run e-commerce business. And due to the COVID-19 interrupts, just like Ben said that now everyone has to work online, live online, purchase online. Yeah, so that means that we, we hold online training classes right now by Alibaba almost two times a week. We hold such kind of online training classes for the rural farmers. Yeah, it's quite important. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think that the government is trying their best to work with the digital platform like Alibaba to lower the threshold of the e-commerce operation by family farmers, since they have no ability to build up the digital solutions or digital platform by themselves. So as a kind of digital company, we will provide such kind of inclusive digital technology to enable the SME to do business easily. So you could see that in the rural areas, almost all farmers could just use a kind of smartphone and do the live streamings and promote their agricultural products. So I think that this is quite important maybe, yeah, for me, yeah. I mean, thank and you so very much. I think we often, we often think about um, the supply aspects of the government role, right? In terms of infrastructure, in terms of funds for research and development, in terms of incentive systems for innovators, like young innovators and startups and, and from the private sector to engage in partnerships. But those demand aspects of it are very critical too, right? The education, the literacy, the appreciation that these communities might have for the opportunities that the digital world is bringing to them. They, 
interest that the young population might have to engage in, in entrepreneurship and leverage these technologies towards entrepreneurship. So very interesting, that perspective also, to not forget about the demand aspect of, of, of the digital sort of uh, digitalization of the world. So and in, in that note, I'd like to switch back to Ben and, and ask you, we know that digital uh, literacy is a major challenge in the rural world. What would you say are the main lessons that you have drawn from your experience trying to bring an app, a digital solution to, to populations that you know, are still developing their, their literacy in that, in that space? Yeah, I, I think for us, it's it's been really a learning journey, both working at Feeble and, and with Farm Better. I mean, we, for example, I'll give you an example. We, we started trainings on organic agriculture in Kenya um, a couple of years ago using two-way SMS systems. So, you know, you send out SMSs, people answer, it's back and forth. And that worked really well. And then we said, okay, you know, let's just expand this to Rwanda, right? That's right next door. It's relatively, let's say, digitalized, and that didn't work at all. Um, so now we're testing audio messages in in in, um, in in the Rwandan case, and that's actually, for example, in West Africa, nobody uses SMS; they only use audio messages. So why why am I giving you these examples? Because it's it's very context specific, but it's it it really pays off to have high literacy rates through your education systems to start with. Not just digital literacy, actual literacy, um, which in the Latin American region is, I would say, on average, a, a really big, you know, is actually a really, really big advantage over other regions in the world. Once you have that, um, I think the, there's the digital literacy aspect. Um, what what we're seeing a lot is that people actually have smartphones, but only use Facebook and WhatsApp in in in, in Africa, uh, in the African context on it, and they don't actually know or find it very challenging to download additional apps. Um, what is really interesting there are, are what I would say kind of youth in the, in the rural areas. So there's often these discussions around how do we, you know, what could be, how do we revitalize the rural space? How, you know, young people don't want to be farmers. So what we see a lot is a family members. So that's key family members kids, they go into into cities and then they teach their parents how to use their smartphones. I mean, you and I uh, so we probably did that with our parents and the computers, right? And now, uh, you know, the next generation is doing the same thing on, on, on smartphones. And and the last thing there, I think, is, is, you know, are there models where we can use young people who are in the rural areas who are probably also farming um, as ambassadors for digital solutions to bring up digital literacy. There isn't really much happening on specific digital literacy programs in much of the world. I, I'm really impressed at what Alibaba is doing in, in the rural uh, Chinese space, but but there isn't much across the world that, that, that would be similar. And I think it would be really interesting and, and impactful to explore, you know, what, what can we learn from that and, and how can we increase that? And it's also, Digital literacy for what? I, people don't just want to learn how to use a phone. That phone needs to create value for them so that they want to learn how to use it. So if you have an e-commerce side or if you have digital trainings, that's that's super useful. Um, but if you have all that and people don't have digital literacy, it, you basically don't reach you don't reach your people and people and and we'll go back to everyone saying, oh, digital doesn't work, but it will work. It just needs we need products that create real value for for the users and we need that push uh, to to increase digital literacy to, to just a basic level where downloading an app is not a challenge. Very curious, very intriguing. I mean, there's many aspects of it. I think one, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about, if you could elaborate a little bit more, what would you say is the role of these local knowledge brokers? Like, you know, these, the, either it is a young person coming back to their community or somebody who's facilitating or translating the knowledge or brokering the solution for for a, a group of, of, of farmers and, and bridging that literacy gap through intermediation. What would you say, what are some experiences learned from that or what, what are your thoughts around that? It's so basically they're key. I mean, even if they're not, even if they're not the specific person on digital literacy, what we've seen in across the countries we've been working in is, is, a, is that digital solutions have a higher trust threshold, I would call it, than like your traditional solutions. If you have a person coming to you, you know, they can show you what they farmed and so on. Digital solutions don't have that. A, they, they're new, so they're already more difficult for people to adopt. And B, why should I trust this? Why should I trust this app? Maybe it's just a scam. You know, there's lots of digital and otherwise scams. So 
people are very are, are, are often afraid to go into these things. It reminds me of the early days of, of Amazon for me when I was like, okay, am I going to put my credit card here? You know, what, what's going to happen with it if I do that, right, back in the day? And, and that, I think, in, in, in rural areas, at least in, in, I would say in, in, in East Africa or where we've been working quite a lot, is still often the case. So trust, often the government, depending on, on the context, has a lot of trust or extension services. So that can be something really to leverage there, also on the digital literacy side. And then usually it's the community itself and family members. So these these knowledge brokers are key to really as 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 kind of you know early adopters of these innovations of showing what can be done of uh, to improve their lives. And they're also key. I was just in Nepal a couple of weeks ago. In Nepal, you know, gender, gender, the gender issue is a completely different one. There's been huge emigration of of men. So most people farming are actually women to the largest extent. And they all have smartphones because that's the way they're in touch with their husbands abroad through Facebook Messenger. So that creates like, that's the other way that these kind of, you know, the people who go to the city or go abroad really bring in digital, digital transformation nobody I, I never thought of this of this pathway but like you'd have much more you know women in nepal on smartphones rural women in nepal on smartphones than in in in, in let's say east africa very very interesting ben and i think it's, it's just really fascinating how you you have been able to sample experiences from from different continents and countries and try to draw these conclusions that some of them might be site specific and others could be could be of use across context. So it's really uh, fascinating to benefit from, from that perspective. Um, it, it's Anneline, still with us, Anneline, you're there. So I have a, a, another question for you. Um, in the world, only 48% of women has internet access. Well, the percentage of men reaches 58%. In China, uh, internet users are 60% women and 40% men. Ben was just pointing to, to, to some of those uh, facts for Nepal also. But how have you addressed gender gaps in e-commerce and rural digitalization? Yeah, in the trend of digital transformation, we know that a lot of new formats of new jobs are emerging, just like I, in my video, I recommend some to you. And in fact, just like Ben said, that in the rural areas, the left behinds are normally children, women, and gray hairs. Yeah, but you know, everyone has, almost everyone has a kind of smartphones. Yeah, so this, this, that, that means that women, if they, they're willing to learn something, this is the good opportunity. So I think that I always like to say that education is important. So for example, now I based in Pingsun and each month I would like to do more and more live streaming training for women here. You know, women like to talk. They are talk, always talkative. So <laughs> live streaming is quite suitable for them. Yeah, maybe they just for fun, maybe it's just to arouse their interest. And if they know that it's quite easy to do such kind of live streaming, then it's, for, it, it's really quite easy for you to tell them, to educate them how to use such kind of smart home, smartphones to be a kind of tourist to do business. Yeah, that's the first step. So I think that according to my first hand observation and my underground experience, I think that in fact, the, the left behind women they are quite responsible and capable when learning the new things. Yeah. So I think that the women in Pingshun, they have, some of them even have demonstrated some entrepreneurial potential. Yeah. So the percentage, I have to say that the percentage is quite high. And I think that digital transformation, in fact, is is the it is just the trend for us human all and as Hillary said that human rights is women's right women's rights is human's rights so in fact it's the same and I think in fact the be, yeah because of the digital technology it has lowered the threshold of the 
uh, some kind of new jobs. So in fact, we have provided such kind of equal opportunities for women and men. So I think that in this kind of trend of digital transformation, we will try our best to promote or uh, to offer more inclusive opportunities for women and human beings all. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Annalie. Very interesting um, on the side of inclusion, but also on the side of segmentation, the observations that you're seeing, you know, they, 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 that women, rural women tend to be na natural sort of marketeers leveraging this live streaming, uh, the potential of live streaming. Um, I'm very curious about the experience. I, was, I, I would have, uh, um, you know, live streaming has a lot of demand on, on bandwidth and internet. So it's just very interesting to see that, that, that uh, you've been able to deliver solutions that, that, that demanding, I guess, on the, on the in internet infrastructure, I guess, a testament to how advanced China might be with respect to, to, to some other regions. Um, ben, I have a, a, a question in terms of sort of the interoperation uh, between public and, and, and private sector, which is what, what one of the important themes for us. Um, what would you say are, should be three main reasons uh, or, or, or three broad reasons why the public and private sector should engage and work together to bridge or bring this digital solution to, to the countryside and to small older farmers. What are the top reasons? Why should this engagement occur? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I, I, I would say first, because already on the non-digital side, it's happening, right? We have private and public extension. We have, we have a lot of partnerships, sometimes competition, but mostly partnership between those actors. And, and why not bring that into the digital age, right? Um, that's, that just seems like a kind of a, a common sense, okay, let's move forward together. B is just the, the size of the challenge. Um, I think neither the private nor the public sector alone can really do it um, without an, in, an enabling policy environment. It's impossible to build businesses in rural areas. And it's especially much less interesting than, than doing it in a lot of uh, urban areas. So, so you know, the, the private sector can really create the conditions, uh, sorry, the public sector can really create the conditions to make those rural markets um, interesting and, 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 and more profitable. And lastly, you know, um, the public sector can really benefit from the experiences in many countries on, on digitalization, but also from the fact that, you know, if, if done right, right, if set up as a business, uh, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be kind of a sustainable way of moving forward with providing services to farmers that maybe with, um, with limited budgets on the public side might not always be able to be kept up. So I think that the, the government should really create the right conditions uh, for the farmers to benefit, but also for businesses to be able to come in. And, and, and then the two, uh, you know, the, the, the private businesses really can create wealth and, and shared prosperity for, 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 the, for the people in the rural areas. Excellent point, Ben. Um, I'm actually curious to ask uh, Aniline the same question. Uh, from your experience, what are uh, three key reasons, three key incentives for the private sector and the public sector to engage, to bring these, these solutions and, and, and the benefits of, of digitalization to smallholder farmers? Yeah, in my opinion, I think that the three key incentives for them is making more money. Yeah, that means reasonable, reasonable profit is quite important. Especially if they can get more money yeah, from the e-commerce than the traditional distribution channel. This would be the most important one. Yeah. Secondly, I have to say, education of digital literacy free provided by government or social organization is also quite, it's also quite important. Yeah. Thirdly, I think the inclusive digital service platform for SME to do business easier is also the key issue. Yeah, because it will enable them to access to such kind of new business, new business model, yeah, easily. So this is my opinions. Yeah, thanks. 
Thank you, Annalyn, so, so very much. And, and, and thank you, Ben. This has been just really a fascinating uh, learning opportunity, tons of lessons to be drawn from what you've shared with us, from, from your responses, from, from your presence, from your enthusiasm around this, the, this problem and opportunity space that brings us together. Uh, on behalf of the organizing group, thank you so very much uh, for participating in this uh, digital fair. And uh, we look forward to more engagement. We look forward to expanding this conversation. Uh, and we're extraordinarily grateful. Uh, in particular, I should say, we understand what time it is for you. Uh, yeah, Annalene, you're, you're over midnight right now. It's late for both, but Annalene, thank you so very much for, for making the time to join us okay. today. And, it's my pleasure, yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Ben, also. Um, Very welcome. Thanks for having me. It, 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 it's been it's been a pleasure. So, um, mm -hmm. um, we're we're getting to 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 the closing of this event, uh, and with that, uh, we'd like to invite uh, all friends or our guests uh, to visit the stands of the of the fair to continue benefiting from from the content that we prepared for you. And, and if you wish, please. Uh, share with us your thoughts, your, your experiences in the, in the social wall that you're going to find in, in the platform. We want to thank the support of FAO China South-South Cooperation Program, um, a response and recovery to the impact of COVID-19 on rural livelihoods and food systems in the countries of the community of Latin America and the Caribbean states, CELAC, and the South-South Cooperation. We also very much appreciate the, the work of uh, FAO training and invite you to review the section on the courses uh, available uh, on the fair. And we also want to thank the support of FAO training for its technical support on those courses. On behalf of FAO and on behalf of the 1000 Digital Villages program, I thank you for your presence and your participation. See you soon. Yeah.